Good evening, and welcome to Damapta. I'm Lawrence Rogers. On tonight's program, we will bring you the highlights of the events that happened during this year's Trappist workshop that was held in Inuvik. Special speakers from the South and locals were presenters at the workshop, and the workshop was well attended. We're glad that you could join us. Enjoy the program. Um, I'd also like to welcome everybody and thank the uh, RRB and the uh, Nivaluit Game Council Joint Secretariat for uh, um, getting everybody here. It was uh, an interesting uh, go around trying to trying to make this happen this year. The uh, original intent for the workshop, like this is the second one. Last year we had one. It uh, appears that we've got more people here this year than we did last year. The original intent was uh, to get trappers together. Um, if it works out once a year on an annual basis, that's great. To talk about common issues that, um, that affect trappers. And I think as, as we go through the years, at least since I've been around, um, we're slowly becoming to realize that um, it's not just what happens in our own region is, is what we need to be concerned with. There's a lot of things that are happening in the territories, in Canada, in, 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 on the global market that, that affects trappers, not only how you trap, but also in, in, um, in how much you, you, you get for your fur when you send it out. The, uh, the global economy has, has a lot to do with, uh, with the fur market. Um, and this is a, you know, it's, it's a forum, a place where people can get together and, and uh, uh, we can bring some of that information to you guys and you people can bring some of your concerns to us and uh, hopefully we can, we can move forward and keep the trapping industry somewhat going. Um, this year what we have on the, on the agenda is, uh, first we'll, uh, we'll look at some of the action items that uh, we identified last year. We'll go through them point by point and uh, we'll explain just where we are with them. Some of them we've made uh, good progress with, some of them we haven't. Um, we have uh, people here to talk uh, about the international fur agreement that, uh, that was signed last year and what, those, uh, uh, what the implications are on us and, and, and you people as trappers. Um, there's a gentleman from Yellowknife that's going to talk about the NWT fur strategy, which is a departmental initiative on, on how we can keep the uh, trapping industry and the territories going. Um, we have a gentleman, we talked a little bit about uh, <coughs> trap research last year. We, uh, we couldn't get anybody from Gregorville to come up, but uh, we did see a video this year. We actually have a gentleman here who uh, can explain some of the processes <coughs> that uh, result in, in, for example, a C120 Magnum trap, which is, which is what uh, is, is the standard for, for Martin trappers and, and Ming trappers, for example. Well, he can explain just why that trap ended up being like that trap is and hopefully answer some of the questions as to why it's so heavy or why are these striker bars here, uh, why, are, why is the, 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 the trigger designed the way it is. Well, that's what these people do when they're in Beggarville. Um, <clears throat> later on this evening, there's a, a short presentation from the Eklavik and Tuck Fur Shops and they'll have some items on display so uh, we can see some of the finished products of, of what the, uh, the fur that gets sent out of here, um, what the result is. Tomorrow, we are gonna bring in some, some fur. We've, we've got some uh, fox and some mink and some marten carcasses and uh, we're gonna do some uh, fur handling and pelt preparation. Um, there's more people than I expected so <laughs> I'm not sure how it's going to work, but we'll break up into a couple of different groups and, and uh, then we'll switch halfway through the, through the session. Um, John Nagy and, and his uh, staff will be talking a little bit about fur bear uh, management and, and maybe getting together and starting work on a fur bear management plan for the region. And then uh, future workshops, regional issues and, and uh, things like that. That pretty much is the agenda for the next couple of days. One other thing I'd like to touch on is uh, the agenda items themselves. And getting response back from the Renewable Resource Councils and the Hunters and Trappers Committee. 
I think if we want a workshop like this to continue and if we want the support of the people that, that sometimes have the dollars, we, we need to keep getting agenda items and uh, uh, ideas for what we can do during these workshops. It's uh, sometimes difficult when you're sitting in a UBIC here second guessing or, or, or trying to, uh, to uh, come up with agenda items from the communities if, if we're not getting the input back. One of the things that I had thought of actually last night was maybe uh, before the end of the workshop, we could come up with a few agenda items for the workshop next year as a group here, and then we're assured that, that the workshop and the agenda that is set each year is, is, is set from the grassroots and, and the hunters and trappers committees and, and the renewable resource councils. Having said that, I thank you all for coming again. And uh, we'll get on with it. And make sure that uh, we're addressing and discussing some of the issues, concerns that everyone here has. And so what we'll do now is just go around to the various tables. And if we've got uh, one or two issues, we will write them down. And then we'll stick these up on the wall. And then tomorrow afternoon, we'll go through them and make sure that they've been covered. Or we'll cover them tomorrow afternoon. It's very important that we cover things that people uh, have been concerned about concerning trappers and, and uh, fur bears. Okay, we'll just start at uh, Paul's table here and just work our way around. Paul, did you guys have any specific issues? Three issues were brought uh, to this table here, and one of uh, the main one is the uh, trap exchange program, which uh, has been implemented, but uh, we wonder where it's at right now. Uh, Changing the leg hole traps to a uh, Okay. Number two. And exchanging uh, outdated Connie bear traps for uh, new traps. That's part of the trap exchange? Or? Okay. Yeah. And also, um, there was uh, there was uh, mention of uh, fur being caught by Connie bear traps, but uh, they were not accepted because it looked like they were caught by leg holes, so it's hard to determine whether <laughs> Whether these were uh, whether these furs were uh, caught by the specific traps that uh, was uh, introduced. I'll just put for that one just to summarize: uh, common bear damage yeah. uh, to fur, and then uh, we can expand on that later. All right. Uh, those were the three issues that were brought up. Uh, okay. Well, the two of them were having to do with the traffic stage, and then one on the common bears. First one was um, trappers should have um, easy access to uh, getting traps <coughs> where to buy them and stuff like that. And another one is they should get the uh, information on for prices more often. Older trappers that just uh, go a short ways to trap. Older trappers which? That go just a short ways to trap. They, they're concerned that they might or may be getting deductions from their you know, old age pensions. Okay. Another one said then there should be subsidies for shoppers to get supplies. Showing the furs, they're going to do some uh, showing some furs after, and we're 
interest in that. And, uh, okay, I'll put here. Going good first. Okay. Going good first. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's just another. Thing. Okay. Norm, please. Yeah. And let's let's uh. Not the end of this one. Oh, okay. came up with the workers' compensation uh, guidelines or the process. issue but a concern that Neil had is RRC coordinator for Nevis is that he doesn't see um, too much uh, trapping being practiced around this area. So the, the trapping is decreasing. Yeah. Okay. And I guess um, in uh, terms to Connor there for uh, my concern or just something I'd like to bring up is uh, I know a lot of uh, trappers are uh, mostly old, older trappers who are um, their idea is opposite, that Connor Bear over quick kill, there's his vice versa. Okay, so that goes um, back to this one, this one here again. That Connor Bear is not yeah, quick kill. Uh, yeah, like opinions, are, they differ, but uh, that was just um, something I thought was a little interesting. How uh, yeah. a lot of them just said that they could trap in period because the new uh, traps that are put out don't, don't suit them. Okay, good. money that they get back can be put towards um, getting uh, some sort of UI when the trapping season is over. More work should be done on that. Okay. Um, well, the other one free eye here. So we don't forget that one. The other one was brought up already, but um, we need um, some sort of outfit here where trappers can be helped more. Um, you know, we keep bringing up the idea of that purple gas that the farmers get. So Maybe that's something that we uh, already can look into for for the trappers here. Okay. That leads into another one of the definition of a trapper. <coughs> and the other item was that Henry, I think more work should be done on that. Okay. So the one was a trapper definition? some trial period set for uh, we can take a look look at it, see if it does work. Is it okay. beneficial to hear? And the other uh, item was I'd like to get a second opinion on on our fur that goes um, goes to the fur auction. Last year we heard um, somebody mention that our fur is uh, put in with fur from I think it was uh, northern BC and Alaska. But we'd like to see um, a second opinion on that because some people still think that the cold weather makes better fur rather than the wet weather. The fur prices so low and poor these days that and I think there's work being done on a expanding that a travel workshop. I thought I'd see you, I thought I'd see Ron Morrison on here, but he's around a will be expanded in the cottage. Well, the Clavic right. Fur Shop is having right. the Clavic and also the Tuck. Right. We also have students here from the uh, NRTP program from the uh, college. They're also here attending the workshop, so uh, welcome. And with that, we'll continue on with the agenda. Uh, we have Brian Roberts and also Alison Beal to give us the uh, an update on the European Union International Fur Agreement and also the in implementation process 
for the Agreement on International Humane Trafficking Standards. So we have Brian Roberts here. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I've got a bit of a cold, so I hope my voice uh, holds out. Roger, can you hear me back there? We've got a mic, so you don't have to haul right Well, it gets, I'm, I'm not that dexterous, and handling the mic and my overheads could be difficult and embarrassing if I start dropping one or the other. Uh, I do have some upper, a number of overheads and people on the sides. Uh, I suggest you move now, otherwise you probably may not see them. Uh, bit of a history lesson. Uh, I've been involved in the fur issue with Indian Affairs for a long time, uh, 13 years in fact, and 10 of those years I've been working on, uh, with hundreds of other people, the European issue, uh, which came to a conclusion last January. So you're going to get a bit of a history lesson leading into what the agreement exactly was in terms of what we negotiated, why we negotiated it, why it's important to you, what it means to you, and what will happen as it's implemented over the next uh, five, six, seven, eight years. When I'm finished, Allison will go into the details in terms of what the agreement means in terms of traps being used in Canada and the research protocols which are being used at Vigerville. And then you'll hear from Al later on this afternoon more detail, in fact, about the Vigerville program run by the First of Canada. So I'm going to start off with the big picture and we'll work down to the little ones in terms of the trap research. Uh, this issue did not start with the European regulation in 1991. It started way back in the early 1980s with seals, uh, in the East Coast seal hunt in particular, and the European Union passing a law in 1983 which would ban the importation of blue backs and white coats, newborn, harp seals, and hooded seals. If you look at that law, it never mentions cruelty, it never mentions humaneness, it never mentions cute little babies. What it mentions is concern about the conservation status of harp and hooded seals. Now, the harp seal happens to be the most popular species of seals in the Northern Hemisphere. So what were the real concerns? And I think all of you know what the real concerns were. Now here's a picture. That's not maggots, that's seals. And that's a picture that I took in 1982 at the seal hunt. And we flew over those seals for five miles like that. Uh, that population has now doubled. There are twice as many seals now as there were in that picture. And that was just a fraction of them. So the European concern was not really conservation. It was the packaging of seals, or the packaging of the seal issue. So the same people that won on the seal issue decided, well, this is such a winner. We made so much money on it. Let's see if we can do the same thing with fur, because it's the same optics. Cute little animals, cruelly taken by a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing, the animals are endangered, and so on and so on. And so for the politicians in Europe, this is a very appealing issue because no jobs are affected. Every time they talked about it, they seemed to be like Mother Teresa. They were concerned about the, the endangered animals, the cruelty, the little babies, and so on. A perfect issue for politicians because it cost them nothing. There were no jobs being affected. As I said, they always got this terrific press time. So in 1991, this law was passed. What it said, or what it says, because it is in place, is that unless you ban all lake hole traps or trapped in accordance with an international humane standard, 13 species of fur would be banned from entry into Europe starting in 1996, and then it was delayed for a few years. What did they say their objective was? Well, they had two objectives. One was to conserve endangered species, and the other was to encourage the use of more humane traps. Um, unfortunately, the 13 species that were listed, none of them were endangered, so some had, had to question, in fact, why they listed species like coyote and beaver and muskrat as being endangered species. The other thing that was a bit puzzling was, although the legislation was about humaneness and encouraging more humane trapping, it didn't define what a humane trap would be. So for us, it was somewhat uh, puzzling. But what Canada did was went to Europe and said, I just want to confirm here, you're not trying to kill our fur trade. Absolutely not, they said. No, never crossed your mind. We don't want to kill the fur trade. We said, well, that's a great relief to us because we thought maybe you wanted to kill our fur trade. No, 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 no. What we're worried about is conserving endangered animals and making trapping more humane. We said, well, that's fantastic. Now you can join with us in our efforts. And you hear from Allison in a few minutes about the millions of dollars that have been spent on trap research. Finally, the Europeans are concerned 
about trapping as we are. Here's what we've done. And right now we have Allison to give us the, uh, uh, an update on the implementation process for the agreement on international conveyance trapping standards. Welcome, Allison. First of all, uh, I work with an organization called the Fur Institute of Canada, and it's important that you know what that is. We are a national nonprofit organization that was formed in 1983 by the federal, provincial, and territorial governments and the fur trade. And the purpose of this organization was essentially to uh, be a non-government organization that would look after the interests of all of the sectors of the fur trade. And in the discussions that led up to the formation of the Institute, the governments and the, and the fur trade identified what is Canada's fur trade. And then they said, okay, we've got this trade, we have to make sure there's total representation. In your briefing books, there is under tab seven, I think, you find this little paper called What is the Fur Institute of Canada? And on the back, it shows you what our membership is composed of. So we have the federal government, we have the provincial and territorial governments, trapper organizations, aboriginal organizations, fur farming organizations, conservation agencies and organizations. We even have animal welfare agencies involved not to mention the wholesale fur dealers, the auction houses, manufacturers, and retailers of fur. And we also have a special membership category called associate members. And those asso that associate membership is open to anybody who supports the ideals and principles of the Fur Institute, which is first and foremost to look and see to the optimum development and conservation of the fur resources of Canada and the sustainable use of the resource. So if you don't believe in that, you can't be a member of the Fur Institute, first and foremost. And this is a way of protecting <coughs> your organization from having people who would rather not see a fur industry happening, from becoming into the organization and perhaps corrupting the ideals that we hold dear. Okay, so when I was showing you when I was showing you the the back in 1950 or something, and fur trader come up and probably want to look back there. He can he can look back there, so sometimes he it's here. So so what they come up with with this is they cut a cut a place out like this on on the pelt, and right there you could see the fur. Once the fur buyer sees that, that fur right here, you could tell what's up here. This is what they call the window. And the tail part, the tail part is it's like, they make, they make a lot of, they make coats with these. So when, when, like before, I was telling you that, in 1950 or something like that, people used to stretch their fur. So when you take it to Hudson Bay Company, and first thing, first thing what they do is they take a measuring tape, and measure the thing, right in front of the fabric, so the fabric would stretch it more. That's what he was doing. But now, today, the fur buyer are are telling the trappers out there how to handle their fur. Now, when you put this, when you put this on the, on the board, before I was calling this a stretcher, towards the end of this program, this, will be, this is called a forming board. It's not a stretcher anymore, it's a forming board.
Starting to see the, the leather on it. status of those objectives. The fur pricing program was one you all know about. We came up with that one in 94. And to date, it has been a success. It has stabilized the price of fur for most harvesters. In other words, you do know what you are going to get for your fur by the price we, we, we offer you. Um, we do get um, one of the other uh, objectives of the fur pricing program was to encourage harvester participation. In other words, we were losing harvesters at a drastic rate in the NWT, so in introducing the fur pricing program, we encourage people to go back to, to trapping as a way of life. In other words, you, if there's a high price on muskrat or, uh, or martin or whatnot, you will go out and get them because, you want to, because it's good money. And we have also increased the value of NWT fur. Since 1994, the harvest, we have increased harvest level by 1,000 additional trappers than what we had in 94. Thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the program. Hunters and Trappers Committees, Renewable Resource Boards, and the Department of Resources, Wildlife, and Economic Development are some of the organizations that could steer the young new entry trapper in the right direction. Thanks again for watching. Good night.